screen. We'll be starting with Mark O'Flynn, who, as I said, is our poet in the July spotlight. Born in Melbourne, Mark O'Flynn now lives in the Blue Mountains on Darug Gundungurra land. He's published six collections of poetry, as well as novels, collections of short stories, and a memoir. And for those of you who were with us in March, Liquid Amber Press was thrilled to have published his most recent poetry collection, Undercoat, Poems About Painting, um, in March this year. So over to you, Mark. I think you've got an image you'd like me to share, so make sure you stick your hand up um, when you're ready for me to do that. Over to you. Okay, I will. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Uh for that lovely uh, acknowledgement of country too, which I endorse. Um, thank you to Liquid Amber Press and for everybody involved in uh, organising these readings. Um, uh, Rose has asked me to read a couple of poems uh, for a few minutes, and I thought I'd start with one from Undercoat, from, uh, which is very typical of the, of the way I kind of like to work, which is to bounce off other people's work, like in this case, paintings. So in Undercoat, the poems are all about responses to um, famous paintings and some not so famous. So I thought I'd read one from this book. This painting is from Joan Miro, the Spanish surrealist, and it's very abstract. And I, whereas some of the other paintings that I tend to respond to are quite um, narrative based and conventional, you can see a story. But even so, this is just splashes of color. and spoke to me. So it's called, the, it goes by the unlikely title of, The Lark's Wing, Encircled with Golden Blue, Rejoins the Heart of the Poppy, Sleeping on a Diamond-Studded Meadow. You have to wonder what sort of opiates they were on, the title certain abstract surrealists dreamed up. Perhaps none. The heart of the poppy we can clearly see floating in the green evening sky. But the lark swing, that's stretching it a bit. So too the yellow simplicity of the earth glowing under the margin of the night's quiet encroachment, where all the shrinking cities have yielded to this single act of optimism. Don't be fooled by the title. What matters is the crimson scab of the poppy about to be extinguished like the coagulating sun in a sea of oil. Um, so I, I like to, in that particular collection, bounce off paintings, but I have my uh, antenna open or my radar tuned for quirky anecdotes from different um, fields of endeavour like science or history or things like that. So this next poem, I was invited to about three poetry readings, all of which were cancelled due to COVID. Um, and so this particular poem has been hammering on the doors of the attic trying to get out. So now's its opportunity. Sad to say, this is a true story. Uh, and it comes in the form of a year nine science project. It's called Einstein's Brain. Introduction. First, Ned Kelly's skull, then Farlap's mighty heart. Phrenology and the history of morbid awe. Next to be purloined for purposes of research was Einstein's brain, plus his eyeballs, given as a present to Albert's ophthalmologist. The hypothesis of the current study posits the question, why? Supposition? Because. Method. With a saw. Back and forth until the cranium popped. Cause of death? A burst aorta. Taken straight from the autopsy by Dr. Thomas Harvey, realising who it was on the slab and what an opportunity this might mean for science. The brain, weighing an ordinary three pounds, aprox, was kept in a pickling jar, in a cider box, under a Budweiser beer cooler, in Tom Harvey's basement for 23 years. Harvey's wife laid down an ultimatum. It's either me or the brain. He chose the brain. Results. Forensically dissected into 240 pieces, the brain became an even bigger jigsaw. Sent out on slides to labs across the country, they counted the neurons, glia, sulci, gyri, only to find, inconclusively, there were lots. The musical cortex, admittedly larger. That's what 10 hours sleep a night 
plus eating grasshoppers will do, which Einstein did. Discussion. He published nothing, Harvey, gave away slices of it to casual fans, did not sell it to the military who wanted it in order to defeat the Russians, themselves collecting brains of their own, lost his medical practitioner's license, found work in a plastics factory in Wichita, eventually returned to Princeton, the brain in a tub in the trunk of his car, not so much at the speed of light, more the speed of a Buick Skylark in heavy traffic, all things being relative. Conclusion, taciturn iconoclast, Harvey behind the wheel, getting too old to care for it now, wanting to donate it back, still listening for what the silence of the brain might have to tell him, what esoteric secrets of the universe, hopefully not in German, which like the nurse who misheard Einstein's dying words, Harvey did not speak. Um, so that's Einstein's brain. <clears throat> uh, Rose suggested that I might like to read some a couple of poems about uh, from poets that I like, and uh, I picked a couple of short ones. And this is also indicative of how I like to kind of bounce off other poems. These aren't mine. I'm going to read some other people's poems. The first one by James Wright. It's a poem, the famous poem that you probably know. I'm sure some of you all know it. Uh, and it's called Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over looking for home. I have wasted my life. Now, bouncing off that is a poem by Andy Kissane, who, again, I'm sure a lot of you know, was a Sydney poet, great poet. He wrote, and this is again a long, unwieldy title. Sitting on the veranda at Ruby's farm, Luskentire, eating pancakes smothered in lemon juice and wild honey. Blades of grass fall over. Rust runs down the outside of the water tank. A cow comes into view, nodding like a tiger on the back ledge of a valiant. Its long pink tongue swivels, anticipating a drink. The joy of not being well read is that there's still so much to discover. And this morning, as I read James Wright's moon poems, I find myself dancing up that mountain and stretching out in the field next to that old blighted can of golden circle crushed pineapple. All about me, there is sun. You can see how those two poems are, you know, bounce off each other and are very clearly um, influenced, or certainly Kassane is influenced. Um, lastly, I'll I'd like to finish with a poem by Gary Catalano, which comes from his recent book, The Collected Prose Poems, which is a fantastic book and I highly recommend it. This poem is very short. It only has four sentences. The language is so utterly plain and yet the mystery is just so profound. I don't know why, but it, it, uh, I find this very uh, uh, inspiring in a strange way. It's called Things. Listen, forget that face. Here are your nails, and here is the hammer you must use if you want to drive them into that bit of wood. And that's all. Thanks a lot for listening. I'm really looking forward to Dominique's reading and to the uh, other people in the open section. Um, long live Liquid Amber. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mark. Fantastic. What a, what a great selection. Um, and you know, wonderful, wonderful to hear your own work. And I see Lindsay riffing off it already in the in the chat, which is great. And and really interesting to sort of hear hear what, where some of your you know inspirations at this moment might be. So um, thank, you. thank you very much indeed. Okay, let's move on to Robin Wiley. Okay, um, Robin is our next open mic um, poet. Robin lives at Rosebrook in Victoria on unceded Gundijmara country. Her poems and stories have been published in various places, 
and she's won the Veranda Editor's Choice Award and the inaugural Beryl Franklin Award, both for short fiction. Welcome very much um, to you, Robin. Lovely to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Rose. It's lovely to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, lovely. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. I'm um, calling from Gunditjmara country in southwest Victoria. I've written a poem um, for my partner uh, who died, and it's a story of his crossing the Simpson Desert on a camel in the footsteps of his grandfather, C.T. Madigan in 1937, uh, C.T. Madigan crossed the Simpson Desert. I believe he was the first European to do so. Monga theory for Mark. I remember you best at the end of long journeys, camel weary, sanding your hair, eyes veiled in palimpsests of clay pans and mungaloo, Dreaming silent of Gigi and Spinifex, the lamp bright star, constellations spanning stillness, eons wide. Chronometer abandoned on the gibber plain, the dead trodden like stones from the sin, wombs unheard, unspoken. In the lurch of a dune crest, wind honed, a vision immeasurable. Immensity of the heart, unhobbled. Melchior, a thousand relics seeded in your eyes, your skin of oxide, leathern palms outstretched, proffering, proffering ash, a strange unspeakable memory of emptiness, a bag of flour, a little tea. That's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Robin. Did you have another poem or? That no, that's it. Lovely. I thought, okay. I thought I mean, <laughs> no, Thank that's, you. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let's um, move on to our next poet, um, which is Jen, Jennifer Compton. Uh, Jennifer Compton's most recent book, The Moment Taken, was published by Recent Work Press in Canberra last year. Um, looks like your bandwidth is low, Jen, so um, here's fingers crossed. L looking forward to hearing you. Can you hear me okay, sweetheart? Yeah, it sounds good. Oh, just I've got to move something, won't be a sec, just so I can scroll. Um, um, I, I realised that um, my bandwidth was not as wide as I would like it to be. Um, okay, I'll get King and Rose, just interrupt me if I go all stupid, okay? Um, I'm a New Zealander. Um, you can probably tell that from how I sometimes I'm not quite sure how a vowel should be pronounced. You'll be able to hear my vowels coming and going. That's something to do with the, the great New Zealand vowel shift. Uh, there was something on Facebook, someone had gone to a baby shower and he'd been calling the host Trish. He'd been calling her Trash. And I thought that was very funny and just asked him if he hadn't been part of the great vowel ship. And I said, for instance, you know, I could say, I've got sex. Yeah, I've got sex, half a dozen. Now, this poem is about... Um, I don't know if it comes off, but it's it's me celebrating the vowel shift. And it's a poem called Ears and Graces. And there's a little um, epigraph that was overheard in a Kiwi pub. He's a great boss. He doesn't toss for coffee, no. He asks us what we want and he makes it for us. He's got no ears and graces. Fridays, dumb of men in shirt, in shirt sleeves, kicking back. The brunt of them have homes to go to. They peel off. The swing door sweat. Once alone, two men alone, leaning across their beers. Oh man, it's just got so dark. It's all turned to shit. And it's dark in the beer garden. 
they are standing silhouettes. One man is looking down, the other tilts his head. Everything turns to shit in the end. They touch foreheads almost, a breath between them. Drain glasses, set them down with a dull thunk, as if someone else will deal with them, which they will. They leave together with slow and solid grace, casting their face out to catch the light or to escape it. Thank you, Jen. Are you done, my dear? Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Okay, all right. You Thank you. Me? Yes, absolutely. I was just waiting for more. Thank you very much, Jen. Fantastic. Oh, perfect. That's great. Thanks, Always Doug. good to leave them, leave them hungry. Um, okay, our next um, our next open mic poet. There, yes, there you are, Nikki. Um, spotlighted. Nikki Casamatis is an educator. Um, uh, for po uh, and poetry, sorry, is an educator for poetry, a well-being practitioner. Oh, hang on, someone's I'm just going to meet someone. Um, I'm based in Brisbane. When not teaching, he loves to work, sharing the joy and healing power of the humble poem. Now I seem to be getting a bit of feedback here. Is that me? Or is that somebody else? Uh, Dominique, I'm just going to maybe. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, Nikki, Nikki has three books published under the pseudonym Veronica Cassiani in Dera Press, and she creates poetry and art to appeal to a broader audience. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Rose. This one is called. Fair Bianca. Autumn does not do a song and showy dance in these parts. Wise Bianca stands content to let the little ones play and usher in the cold. Fair Bianca, her stature demure, modest by anyone's standards, but she does not mind the odd quick step. She is nimble and spreads her fragrance like an Avon lady door knocking the street. Fair Bianca will give you two choices. Either get on your knees and pay her due homage or prayerfully cut her off for indoor meditation, your olfactory companion for just a few short days. Fair, fair Bianca, we know you. Your aroma brings ecstasy. Fair Bianca, we see you, your petals miming, all's fair, all's fair in love and this we will know. She will walk us through winter from where it's just a hop, skip and jump into that bed of roses. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki, absolutely lovely. Um, okay, all right, let me move on to our next open mic speaker. Welcome, Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay Tuggle is the author of Calenture and the Afterlives of Specimens, which I think perhaps was the, the point of interest with, uh, with Einstein there, Mark. Yeah. Um, Lindsay lives and writes on unceded Gundungurra land. And I'd like to say that Lindsay and I met each other at a conference, what do you reckon, 10 years ago, maybe? I think it might be even more. It might be. And, you know, we had a really lovely connection and it's beautiful to see it blossoming uh, even today. So welcome, Lindsay. Great to have you here. Over Thank you. you. Thanks so much, Rose and Pauline, for convening. Um, I have found this these readings to be a real comfort um, in recent months. Um, and thanks also to the readers. Um, I'm gonna read just a couple of poems from a chat book that's coming out next month um, called Kinship Studies. And the first poem is called Garments. Come closer. Now the vast dusk recedes toward the far reaches of our remembrance. This dust that I adore was once a girl. Her face a haze romanced by many a long winter. 
eyes trellised in stone, laughingly dashed with blonde, mad filaments bridled, stuccoed with birds all over. Resurrectionists loiter as our nimble ghost casts off her weathered garments. The grave cannot halt her magic. Death warrants aren't meant to be believed, not entirely, not at first. Such hardy animals, humans, blind sleepers all the same. Dauntless, her sylvan form descends, bright-eyed and elastic with love. Capture is a form of kindness. So habit yourself to the dazzle of her glossy limbs, adrift in loam, her uncut hair threaded with moss. We are not so different yet that we cannot wear each other's clothes. What's left of me is only her effaced. Appalachian origin fades to ornament grass-stained in transference a girl ago. How wide a difference still we lie beyond. And this is just a, a very short poem. It's the um, obligatory pandemic poem, but with a nod towards the 19th century. Um, and it's called Rivulets. All the lost ones glide silently by, wayward, ever modern their fair reversals postponed. The grave is a fable only. Down a narrow aisle amid thieves, the plague work goes on. Sisters sleep side by side in ateliers of trivial breath, lost in the float and odor of hair. In our dead house, rhyme beards the grass, leaving footprints with no source. Black lines creep as fields unfold in sibilant quarrels to gossip of the night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Wonderful.